Okay, so we figured out the heat load of the building. We figured out how, how big the boiler has to be. We figured out the radiators and where they're going to be. And now let's look at a few ways of controlling them. Ah, pneumatics. This is a radiator in, uh, in New York City, in the New York City Public Library. And I liked it because it had a pneumatic control over here, which pneumatics means air-based. And over here we have a steam trap. So let's look at that first. Steam traps, trap steam. It's, it's an aptly named device. That's the beauty part of, uh, of most of heating. If you want to know what the thing does, you just turn its name around and it tells you its function. Air vents, vent air, steam traps, trap steam. Condensate pumps, pump condensate. And if you want to extend that to plumbing, you could say that P-traps, well, you know. So we've got here a normally open automatic valve. And the way it works is inside the cover here, we've got a bellows that's partially filled with a volatile liquid. Typically, it's alcohol. And we pick a liquid that boils at a temperature lower than water. So alcohol will boil at about 180 degrees. And uh, we put this in here, and the bellows is... is partially filled with the alcohol, brought up to temperature, and then sealed while the alcohol is boiling. And then they remove the heat and allow the bellows to cool. So now the alcohol is going to condense inside, and the atmospheric pressure of the air on the outside of the bellows is going to cause the bellows to scrunch up. At the bottom of the bellows, there's some sort of a, of a, a, a pin that goes into a seat. So this is normally open, and steam pushes the air through the radiator trap, because before a radiator can... Before a radiator trap can trap steam, it must vent air. It's going to push air downstream or it'll leave the system through either an automatic, uh, an automatic air vent or the vent line on a condensate pump or a uh, boiler feed pump receiver. So when steam arrives at 215 degrees, it's going to cause the alcohol on the inside of the bellows to flash into a vapor. That's going to increase the pressure on the inside of the bellows which will cause the bellows to expand, pushing the pin down into the seat, and the trap is now closed. At that point, we need to have about a 10 to 15 degree drop in temperature across that trap before the trap will reopen. So with a thermostatic radiator trap like this, it is possible to check to see whether the trap is working during the winter by taking the temperature here on the inlet side and here on the outlet side. You should always see at least a 10 degree difference in temperature between those two points. If you're not seeing that, there's a good chance that the trap has failed and it needs to be replaced. On the supply side, we have a pneumatic valve. Pneumatic means air, again. So here, this is the valve body. It's a normally open spring-loaded valve. And on top of it is a bellows that's charged with air pressure. This line comes from a compressor. And what's neat about pneumatics, it's very like, steampunky and old school because the thermostats actually have compressed air running through them as well. So when you touch a thermostat because the room is, is too cool, you're going to hear a hiss of air being released. And the air pressure that's pushing this bellows down to push the stem into the valve will be released. And the spring-loaded valve, which is normally open, will open and steam will enter the radiator and you'll have heat in the room. The room gets warm, the thermostat senses that, it sends a signal to the compressor, and the compressor comes on and it goes chugga chugga chugga, and you get air coming in here to push the stem down. So this is very mechanical and pneumatic, and there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong with it, so if you have got a, a pipe that gets damaged or the system begins to leak, that's going to be a problem. So Allen Bradley was uh, the company that produced most of these. And these are all pictures that were posted on heatinghelp.com by the people that come to the wall, which is our bulletin board. And here you see the profusion of pipes, a lot of copper pipes, a lot of steel pipes going out throughout the whole building, lots of places where things can go wrong. And when they do go wrong, this usually gets abandoned, the pneumatic system. You can see the remnants of it here. And in this case, it gets replaced with a thermostatic radiator valve. And this is a non-electric valve. This one's made by Dan Foss. Uh, it's a normally open spring-loaded valve, and on the top of it snaps this temperature-sensitive head. Now, it's not sensing uh, the steam, it's sensing the temperature of the air in the room. So as the air warms up, this is very sensitive, and, and the stuff on the inside, it could be a liquid or it could be a, a wax, will expand and push down on the normally open spring-loaded valve to low, lessen the amount of steam that goes into the radiator. The top of the knob is, is marked 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's the European approach to this. And over here you can see it's obviously on 5 right now. Uh, this is 
equal to 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this job was having a problem because uh, when the pipe got hot, the heat from the pipe was coming right up into the bottom and causing the valve to close. That's why they got it set on five because the radiator valve was shut on the temperature of the heat in the, in the pipe. So the way this was fixed was we exchanged this self-contained head for a remote sensing head that could sense the temperature somewhere else, you know, apply it, put it over here on the wall where it's not going to feel the temperature of the very hot pipe. Easy fix. This is a one pipe steam radiator. It's got an air vent on it. Two pipe steam radiators, unless it's a two pipe air vent system, don't have air vents on them. They have steam traps or some kind of a vapor device. But here we've got an air vent on here. So the steam is coming in, condensing, the condensate is rolling out to the valve, which has to be fully opened or fully closed. If it's fully closed, the radiator is off. If it's fully open, the radiator is on. There's no way to throttle this and make it work because as soon as you start to throttle, the water won't be able to get out. So you'll start to get steam banging the water into this section and it's gonna squirt it out of the air vent and the radiator will just fill up with water and you'll have problems. So to do a thermostatic radiator valve on a one pipe steam radiator, we can't use it here as we did on the previous slide. But what we can do is put it between the air vent and the radiator to deny uh, the radiator's ability to remove air because steam and air have different densities and if the air can't get out, the steam can't get in. So we're gonna use this sort of a thermostatic radiator valve. So this over here would go into the radiator where the air vent would normally be. This is an air vent over here and we like to use a straight shank air vent on here so the condensate can more easily drip out. This is a normally open spring-loaded valve and onto this screws this temperature sensitive head. So this is gonna sense the temperature in the room. We have it set for three, which would be 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So when the room gets to be 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it's gonna shut the radiator, TRV, thermostatic radiator valve. And that means that the radiator can no longer have access to pushing the air out of the vent. Now what's critical to make this work is we've got a, a built-in vacuum breaker here on the bottom. That's important because once this closes, the steam inside the radiator will begin to condense. And when it condenses, it shrinks tremendously. Uh, the difference in expansion from water to steam is 1700 to one. So when you turn, say a, a pint of water into steam, you're, you're making 1700 times the volume of steam, the gas that you had in the one pint glass. So you would need 1700 empty pint glasses to collect the steam that's gonna come off that one pint of water. Now, when it turns back into water, it does just the opposite. So 1,700 pints of steam volume will shrink back down into one pint of water. So the steam system begins to operate like a, like a bellows. Uh, it always begins completely filled with air. Every steam system starts out completely filled with air. When steam forms, it goes off like popcorn. It just expands out of the boiler, pushing the air ahead of itself because steam is lighter than air, so they will not mix together. Steam will push the air ahead of itself down a pipe like it's a, like it's a plunger going down a pipe. And the air will look for an air vent on the way out. But when the steam condenses, it shrinks and the air will come right back into the building through the air vents. Now, if we've got the air vents sealed by the thermostatic radiator valve, because we don't want the room to get any hotter, the vacuum that's going to form inside the radiator due to the condensing steam will draw more air into the, oh, more steam into the radiator. So we need a vacuum breaker on the bottom. So as soon as steam begins to condense in the radiator, the vacuum breaker senses that drop in pressure and lets air back into the radiator, and that's the way you keep a radiator from overheating. And then in real life, here we've got a remote sensor. The problem on this job was, uh, you know, the temperatures were all wrong. Well, the temperatures were all wrong because they put the remote sensor right on top of the steam radiator. Not too bright, but that's, uh, that's what people will sometimes do. Uh, this was in a, in a law office in Manhattan. Here we had the, uh, the remote just dangling in space here rather than mounting it on the wall. So uh, somebody got paid for this without finishing the job. So, but there's the vacuum breaker right there. Good example.